very usual that we are always doing our own tasks and we kind of uh, forget that we're working with humans, right? Uh, we just focus on delivering our tasks. Um, actually, it applies to everyone, upwards or downwards. Um, we must not forget that, hey, this person has a life outside, you know, there's, they have some personal aims, you know, there's some key goals they want to learn, uh, they have some pers uh, professional aspiration. So it's very useful and very uh, required for the leaders to be always conscious about what people want to do here, how can I empower them to do the best of their ability and even, um, let's say, climb the ladder, you know, in, in a bigger organization itself. Mm. Um, so again, back to the question, uh, back to the, the, the thought that, you know, there's no unskilled person. Mm. So you really need to empower people in the right way mm. and not being just, uh, I would say, in, in Asia, the culture, you know, there's a lot of uh, shutting off. Uh, let's say the junior execs, uh, there's a lot of um, what I call opaque uh, leadership, uh, OPIC management. Yen, thank you so much for your time today. Um, we are here to talk about conscious leadership, but of course before we launch into um, what conscious leadership mean to you. I like to start by talking a little bit about what we, what we discussed offline. Yep. I know that you love long distance running mm -hmm. and I'm a big fan of running but not as long as, <laughs> as far as you go. But how do you draw a parallel to your, the long-term vision ethos that you have uh, when it comes to work? Okay, one, one, one interesting thing is um, purely I like long distance running and it's actually a augmentation of my um, hobby in actually alpinism. So actually I, when I was younger, um, I just pack up my bag and I just climb a mountain uh, without help, right? Uh, been to funny places like uh, Tajikistan and things like that. Um, I will say one of the biggest parallel that I can draw is that because my life has been involved in mountains, ultra running as well as alpinism, always takes you upwards and downwards um, in a pretty exaggerated way. So the going part on upwards is always very difficult, right? But you always know that when you go up, there's always a down, down, downhill that you can ride. Um, so I think that really gives um, a push to me normally in terms of how I see things and in terms of, let's say, I may be in very tough time right now, but let's rescope out how far you know, we can see the future and how long we will this go and treat things like a marathon. Just keep going and you know that once you conscientiously keep going, you improve, you evolve, you will reach a place where you can enjoy the downhill ride. Right? But you know, when we, went, when we transit to a downhill ride, it doesn't mean that you, know, you just run crazy down, down the hill because usually it's long too. Right? and you don't want to hurt yourself, right? Because you still have the next up here and things like that and mountains to cross, right? So in the down here, right, it's more on the techniques, right? How do we control the pace and go as fast as we can, right? But not at the, at the, not at the risk of, you know, hurting yourself as a body, right? If you talk about company, not hurting the com company structure and, you know, making people negative because we are getting too much work that we can handle, right? And this all really plays down. I, I see actually in life, there's parallel that can be drawn, hardship and growth. And of course, uh, enjoying the fruits of our labor uh, is three parts that are, I think totally match up this uh, up here and down here, right? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Obviously, we are, uh, the business events industry mm. uh, is severely impacted by COVID. Yeah. Is it hard to maintain that long-term vision, mm -hmm. whilst there are so many disruptions that we are experiencing at the moment. So how yeah. do you keep your vision in sight and how do you use some of the disruption to inform your yeah. long-term vision? Okay, with COVID, it's been interesting because the last benchmark was SARS. And with SARS, it didn't go for so long, right? I mean, now SARS looks like nothing compared to COVID. And the, the fact is that when you are in the midst of such a pandemic, I would say you can't actually see where is the peak. Where is the peak and then after that I will enjoy the downhill ride, which is where the pent up demand starts to show. Um, 
when you are usually climbing a hill, you can't see the pig. And you know, when you, if you have climbed a hill, you go up and you ask the person coming down, how far am I? How far am I? And nobody can actually give you a good gauge because uh, people give you an arbitrary gauge based on their, the hardship that they have faced going up, right? And in this case, for our environment, we do not have such a benchmark. So no one can really tell us. So what I will say is you keep going, but being very focused that you can always keep going up, right? And not stopping. And people, uh, different stakeholders in our industry face different problems and issues, fund financing, um, let's say I have a lot of hardware and, and I've got this on loan, but now it's not being used and things like that. But whatever the case is really to lean down, um, see where is still the best opportunity, um, see where and how you know, we can leverage on, let's say, associations or government help to kind of keep continuing our business or even in the, let's say, worst case scenario, let's take a short break and you know, re-evaluate the kind of um, trajectory that we want to go into. Uh, I have seen uh, agencies, some of the agencies who are hard hit, you know, they go and evolve their offerings into a more marketing-based um, solutions. I have seen people evolving more towards offering, let's say, virtual uh, events, uh, kind of uh, products itself. But it's just um, also a trademark of the industry. It's, there's this tenacity, um, and as any business goal, you need to pivot when you need to pivot, and you need to keep going when you need to keep going. Mm -hmm. So I feel that we are not at the end of the road yet. Uh, we receive actually quite a few interesting postponements globally right now uh, in, in places that were very confident of opening up. Mm. Um, so we are definitely not at the end of the road. The, the tunnel is still long. My only, I would say, word to you know even the industry people is keep going, don't stop, um, and find a peak, right? Mm. Yeah. I, li I like your advice about the keep going and leaning down, watch your expense because you know we are all on a cash flow marathon at the moment. Yeah. What I also like about the fact that you know I, we, we were talking about this earlier for the for those who are not as informed when it comes to technology mm -hmm. and the scope of it, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of conversation around diversifying. You know, mm -hmm. doing everything we can around yeah. the tech side. Mm -hmm. But what I like about Jubilee, your company, is um, you are very firm on your ethos about that connection mm. and and can you explain a little bit about that focus yeah. um, and why why you why you, you strongly believe in the, in the power of connecting people yep so um, one of the strongest belief is actually from um, a word that um, that really uh, impacts me a lot um, by actually uh, the founder of uh, Amazon Jeff Bezos uh, he basically says that you know, do things that doesn't change, right? Um, and when, when you hear of that, you can look at what people are doing around you in the industry itself. You can actually then focus on, hey, what, what's fluff, you know? There are a lot of fluffy stuff that people are doing that that actually is not doesn't have a base fundamental. So what Jubilee does, our main call is in matching, right? Matching is what events is all about. I mean, why do I attend an event? Because I want to meet people, not I want to sit there and just listen to content. As right? a business matching. Yeah, right? business matching. And Between buyers and sellers. Yep. Yes. Um, and a different kind of matching, investment matching um, in medical field, we do partnering because universities, academia, they actually come together to partner and they want to know what each other does. And they, and they try to uh, do this kind of matching at those kind of events. So this matching part does not change and will not change since the dawn of, you know, when events were started, right? And that's why people, I think, one of the key reasons they go to events is for that, yeah. And what I, what I find very admirable as well as, obviously, the three of you founded a company together and you started with like five, six people and now you're around 50 mm -hmm. team members. So yep. congratulations on that growth. Thank you. And I reflected on what you said around there is no unskilled people. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that belief yeah. and also what do you do with that mm. and what are the implications to your business? Okay. If I can go back, way back even, um, I arrived at this uh, state where I, I know that there's no unskilled people. Um, we, we were all three of us as the founders when we started the company we were university grads, right? 
uh, we don't have experience. We probably came in with a very naive mind uh, into the industry and into management of companies. Basically, we do not have any benchmark or any bad experience that we perhaps will, will actually slow the growth. So we start everything on a clean slate. We try a lot of things. So throughout this journey, what I realized is that company has roles and people have skills. When people apply for your company, it doesn't mean that perhaps they don't understand the role correctly um, or, or whatever uh, the case that they think that they may fit the role, but it's actually the role of the company to find that if the skill set of a person or the specialization fits the role itself. So actually in, in, in my ethos now, right now is that no one is unskilled. Everyone is good in their own way, right? Uh, maybe sometimes even out of what a company does, right? But whatever skills that they have, it's very important to find that out and to adapt it into the correct role that's presented in your company, right? So I, I had this recent experience uh, with actually an intern, right? So um, she was doing a lot of stuff. Um, she was a bit, uh, un do not have a bit of direction. And I actually spoke to her and I found out how she actually functions. And just by observing her, I could actually find a better role that she fits in better. And then she start contributing a lot better, right? So that's what, that's what I'm talking about. Like we, we shouldn't think that, hey, she wasn't doing good, good work previously. And we, we have this mind frame that, hey, she's, no good mm. or like he's no good mm. uh, but it's more like maybe let's stop it's not feeling what she's good at we need to reevaluate if we have this role for her and if we have right we need to transit and make mm. her focus in what she does mm. I like, I like it when, yeah. I like it when you say the power of observation because you're observing so what about is it through emails data what is it that you observe Mm -hmm. from a behavioral pattern how do you how did you do that okay in covid times work from home so i can't really sit beside her and observe what so what i observe is um, how she deliver through tasks and the process that i think she goes through in delivering it right and through that i could see that based on this kind of process and this kind of task uh, outcome she did very tasks which one she was good at which one she wasn't good at and based on the good ones how she, did she usually arrive at the destination? Mm. And that process, what role can it fit in, in the company itself, right? Yeah. And, and when you mm. approach her to say, oh, I think you're more suitable for this role, mm -hmm. um, how did you get her to, I would say, psychologically trust you and feel safe that, okay, yeah. you may be right? Okay, first I think it's the, 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 of course, the talk with her to just really identify critically, not as a person, but more into the task and the outcomes itself, right? I think when you reach a stage where you are able to communicate directly to him or her, right? And there's a mutual agreement, that's when you can easily move forward. So I think that is still the main uh, hurdle for, I think, any business owner to cross, yeah? And to, to make it such that it's also something that you believe in as a business owner, that she can thrive in there. And once, you know, let's say a boss says that he believes in you, that you can do it, this thing in a more focused way, I think um, they are more willing to pick it up rather than we are just giving them another task. Yeah, it should not definitely not be presented in that way. Yeah, yeah. That, that is actually really sound advice because many a times, uh, you know, in, in, in the Asian culture, we are not necessarily, when we express things differently, we won't necessarily come to the boss and say, listen, I'm not feeling, yeah. I'm not feeling it at the moment. So it's very kind of you to actually have the observation and say, perhaps we can exploit it that way mm -hmm. and approach her in, in that manner instead yeah. of just letting it sit and, you know, nothing happens. That's right. So, yeah. so I, I really applaud that. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, we um, have, this current series called Conscious Leadership. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? And what are some of the, what are some of the, I would say, uh, attributes uh, towards that, that make Jubilee so unique in a way that, you know, I think you mentioned a little bit about direct communication, 
um, task oriented. Mm. So tell us a little bit about your leadership ethos. Okay, I think the first thing on conscious leadership is to recognize that if we are a leader, we are not the smartest being on the planet. We are not the smartest team being in the team, right? We are here merely to make sure that people are working towards a common goal, right? So when I think leaders recognize that, it really plays down on the ego part of their viewpoints and basically let them be more critical about themselves, about their ideas, and also be more willing to accept uh, others' ideas, right? So I think that's the first, but also that doesn't mean that um, doing business is a democracy, right? Actually, I do not believe in that. Uh, the fact is that um, people still need to give direction and it comes to a point where critical uh, assessment needs to be done by the leadership. So the leadership needs to be very aware and be very fluent with that. So it's not just play. Uh, when we need to be professional and we need to come in, we need to come in, right? So I think that is the second point to augment the first one, right? The other one is the fact that um, there's a focus on, I would say, everyone in the company and being hopefully able to directly relate to each person in terms of their growth and not to take them for given, right? Or for granted, right? Uh, it's very usual that we are always doing our own tasks and we kind of uh, forget that we're working with humans, right? Uh, we just focus on delivering our tasks. Um, actually, it applies to everyone, upwards or downwards. Um, we must not forget that, hey, this person has a life outside, you know, there's, they have some personal aims, you know, there's some key goals they want to learn, uh, they will have some pers uh, professional aspiration. So it's very useful and very uh, required for the leaders to be always conscious about what people want to do here, how can I empower them to do the best of their ability and even, um, let's say, climb the ladder, you know, in, in a bigger organization itself. Mm -hmm. um, so again, back to the question, uh, back to the, the, the thought that, you know, there's no unskilled person. Mm. So you really need to empower people in the right way mm. and not being just, uh, I would say, in, in Asia, the culture, you know, there's a lot of uh, shutting off. Uh, let's say the junior execs, uh, there's a lot of um, what I call opaque uh, leadership. Uh, opaque management, basically, it's a top-down approach. What the leader says, the junior is like, okay, yeah. Like, I recently had uh, this experience uh, with um, this, this client, and you know, uh, we have been working with the junior leadership leader leaders, um, but they don't make the decision, and they have been so um, helpful and conscious that, um, hey, Jubilee is the perfect fit for this thing that we want to do, business matching, right? And then, at the end of tier end, they just receive a note from the management and say, we're not going to, uh, let's say, use Jubilee, right? And um, just tell them uh, we have a lack of time, mm. right? Uh, it's not only saying that we're not going to use Jubilee, but it's actually, I think, brushing off the effort of the people who has been conscientiously uh, trying to make sure that we have the best uh, stuff in place. And that comes down to empowerment. You ask. A person to spend let's say weeks talking to the vendor on something and then at the last moment you didn't even let's say sit down and really critically evaluate you just pass down an order you know like a like a monarchy right uh, like you just pass down an order and then people just like struck and you can see when they approach the next task they'll be like oh this happened you know we just do the bare minimum report it out and anyway they will make the decision and that creates a very toxic kind of leadership uh, just because it's not transparent it's very opaque and um, I feel that conscious leadership should be very wary about being transparent enough communicate downwards in the best way and as well as being very direct um, even if you can, all the way down into your partners because how you treat your partners and your vendors as, as you know reflects on, on on how your company and how your leadership is too yeah, so um, that is probably uh, my my take on the conscious leadership part Yeah. Thank you so much for your time Ian yeah. I really really love what you said Yeah, thank you